a man st saw in a newspaper an ad. It was an ad for brain transplants starting at $5,000. True story. And uh, he thought, hey, I could use a new one. So he went to the address that was printed in the ad, and he walked in the front door, and he said, I, I want a new brain. What is this brain starting at $5,000? And they said, well, it's a lawyer's brain. It's shrewd. It's intelligent. It's a little crafty, sometimes a little dishonest. And the guy said, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to go all out. Do you have anything better? And they said, we do. Come, come this way. And they showed him another brain. It was a doctor's brain. Price tag on it was $15,000. And the guy said, well, that, that sounds pretty good, but do you have anything better? And they said, we do. Come this way. And they brought him into another room. And this room had a, a brain sitting there. And, and they said, this brain is $50,000. It's the brain of a woman. It can multitask. It can talk on the phone. It can do the budget. It can make dinner. It can watch the children. And the guy said, wow, that, that sounds incredible. I can't do any of that. But do you have anything else? And so a couple of employees whispered to one another, and they said, yeah, we have something else. Come with me. And they took the man into a back room, and then under dim light was another brain. And they said, this brain is a quarter of a million dollars. And he said, a quarter of a million dollars? Who, whose brain is it? He said, it's the brain of a politician. And they said, a quarter? He said, a quarter of a million dollars for the brain of a politician, why? Why would it be that much? And they said, well, there's two reasons. One, it's barely used. <laughs> and two, do you know how hard it is to find the brain of a politician? <laughs> if you're in politics, that's a Skip Heisek joke, so Calvary Chapel, Albuquerque, you can send all your letters that, that direction. We live in a day and an age where people are placing their hope in the government. They're placing their, their hope and their satisfaction in what the government can provide. But there is only one place we can place our ultimate hope, and that's in the government and the kingdom of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, the prophet Isaiah spoke. He said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. There is an everlasting kingdom coming. And that is the only king kingdom that we can ultimately place our hope in, and that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 19 of Revelation we saw this new kingdom being ushered in. And that kingdom is called the millennial kingdom. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Now you hear millennial kingdom, and I know what you're thinking, and you're wrong. It's not a kingdom of beards, and beard oil, and selfies, and cold brew coffee, and <laughs> Maddie, what else? What else are we talking about? Skinny jeans. We're talking about the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ here on earth. Let's pray for the study and we'll begin. God, again, we are so grateful for your word. Your word is alive, has the ability to change us if we'll just allow your Holy Spirit to have your way in our lives. So that's my prayer this morning, that we would lay down our agenda, our will, our desires, place them at your feet, and allow you to have your way. We know the work that you do in us is sometimes painful. 
But surgery is sometimes painful. When you remove the things of us that do not belong, when you bring about circumstances in our life to refine us and change us and make us more like you, sometimes that is uncomfortable and sometimes it's painful. But the root of sin in our lives is deep and we know you need to dig deep. But after that surgery is done, there's healing. So do that work in our lives, God. And I pray that many men and women here would be willing to say that prayer as well. Have your way in me so that you may be glorified through my life. And Lord, we know that you use your truth, your word to do that work. So God, we are ready to hear and to respond. Again, thank you for your Holy Spirit living in us. Again, have your way. We love you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we don't often like to discuss death. We don't like to think about death. And it's not until usually a memorial that we consider the topic. We consider the frailty of life and how short life really is. Uh, Speak to Pastor John uh, and myself. We've done many memorial services. Memorial services for a two-year-old all the way up to 90 something years old and it's always too soon the memorial service is too soon but I want you to think about death for a moment I want you to think about what is on the other side of your death when you step out of this life what will you be stepping into you know a lot of people think that they will be stepping into a life lived in the clouds They'll get a harp, maybe a pair of wings, and that's eternity. Eternity is spent in the clouds, singing. Now that part's right. We know from the book of Revelation that we will be praising God, that we will be worshiping him forever. And I know if some of you have said, um, I can't sing. <laughs> and when I think of singing forever, I, I got to be honest, that's not the most inviting thing for me. I think most of us kind of have a low view of heaven. We have a low view of heaven. We look around at the beauty in this fallen world, and somehow we think that this is as good as it's going to get. That somehow heaven will be a step down from this. Somehow heaven won't compare to the beauty that we see even in this fallen world. But as we study the scriptures, the more we realize that our eternity with Jesus is so much more complex and multi-layered than this really strange idea of heaven that we have today. And this low view of heaven, it really needs to change within us. And it will change as we grow in our understanding of what happens after we die. And Revelation chapter 20 is a wonderful place to start. Now again, in chapter 19, we saw the return of the king. Again, Revelation is a study of the last days, the end times. But it is more a study of Christ himself. And in chapter 19, we saw the return of the king, what we know as the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the gospels, all four gospels, speak of a time where Jesus rode into Jerusalem. But he rode in as the humble king. This was the announcement, the official announcement that he was the Messiah that the Jewish people were waiting for. But he rode in on a simple colt, a donkey. And it wasn't even his, it was a borrowed donkey. But in Revelation 19, he made a much different entrance, didn't he? This time he entered through the crowds, the the crowds, the clouds, into the crowds. And he was riding a white horse and his eyes burned with flames of fire. And on his thigh and on his robe was his name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And who is at his side? His church. We ride at his side, clothed with fine linen, white and clean. But this time, he doesn't come to announce himself as the humble king, the Messiah. He comes to judge and make war with the unrighteousness of mankind. And what did that war look like, and what will it look like? It's not a war at all, is it? We read that he 
took the beast and the false prophet and he casted them alive into the lake of fire. And then he spoke a word and the rest of mankind's armies were laid waste by that simple word. And it was that victory that ushered in the millennial kingdom. Now again, that kingdom is a 1,000 year reign of Christ here on earth. It's a 1,000 years of perfect peace. There's no sickness. There's no hunger. There's no injustice. It will be a literal worldwide garden of Eden here on earth. Now again, like many topics in the book of Revelation, due to some of the symbolism There's a lot of contention, even within the evangelical church, about this chapter. But I want to say this. There can still be unity in disagreement. That's something that we've seemed to lose a little bit. Now, don't get me wrong. Scripture Scripture says that we need to contend for the faith. That there's wolves waiting at the door, wanting to deceive the body of Christ. But sometimes I think we take that too far. And we look at secondary issues as if they're primary issues. And that's just as da- dangerous as taking a primary issue and make it a, making it a secondary issue. You understand what I'm saying? There's primary issues. There is one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. There is one God, and it's three in one. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, and Jesus Christ. His word is inerrant. It is his inspired word. We don't get to amend this. We don't get to change this to make it fit into our lifestyle. It is his word, and we stand on the firm foundation of his word. Those are non-negotiables. But there are some things that Christians disagree on, men that love Jesus and love his word, who disagree about the events that take place in this chapter, and that doesn't make them heretics. There can still be unity in the body of Christ, even if there's disagreements. It's funny, there's a story of two pastors who were arguing over this topic of end times theology. And the exchange started to get heated, and finally one of the pastors said, let's stop this, we're friends. Let's agree that you have your way of looking at it, and I have God's way. So, just so that, because again, this can be confusing. So, I I want to just give you some of the different interpretations of this passage. And I'll let you know what uh, angle or or what view we we hold, but it's not going to surprise you. And really, the differences of opinion when it comes to interpreting this chapter comes down to two different things. You can either take the literal approach, which is obviously the approach that we've been taking throughout the book of Revelation, that the Bible means what it says and says what it means, or you can take a symbolic or spiritual approach, and that's what some of the other views do. Now, the early church predominantly believed in a literal 1,000-year earthly reign of Jesus Christ. It wasn't until the third century that a new view was presented. And that view is called amillennialism. And in the late third century, that became more widely accepted. And it's a view that taught that the millennium, the millennium wasn't really a literal 1,000 years, but it was more a, a symbolic representation of the time after Jesus Christ defeated Satan on the cross and rose again. That Satan was defeated on Calvary. And that he is no longer active in this world today. And that this thousand years is more of a, kind of like you know in the Old Testament where it says that God holds a thousand cattle on all the hills. It's not a literal, literal 1,000 cattle. But again, it's spiritual. It's not literal. Jesus is reigning now in his kingdom, but he's not physically here on earth. This was a view that Augustine adopted, and then the Catholic Church also adopted, and now many Reformed theologians agree. Not all, but some. And then another view kind of was birthed out of that view. It was called post-millennialism. And it teaches that the millennial age will happen in this age. 
that the church will be successful in spreading the gospel to all the corners of this earth. And slowly but surely, all of humankind will become born again and the entire earth will be redeemed. And once we have redeemed the earth, that will usher in the literal return of King Jesus. So the idea is that the world will get progressively better and better as the church takes dominion over earthly institutions, the government, the financial system, and then that will usher in the coming of Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting because that view kind of lost a little bit of steam during World War I and during World War II, during the Holocaust, and during the Great Depression. But it's becoming, again, more prominent now. And you're going to see this in kind of the Kingdom Now theology, or the Dominion theology, in the Charismatic movement. But again, different views. It's not heretical movements. It's just different ways of interpreting this section of Scripture. But if, again, if you've been with us for a while, you know the approach we're going to take. It's the literal approach. It's called the pre-millennial position. And as we go through this chapter, I think you'll see why. So let's take a look. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, the, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he may not, might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then verse 4, 5, 6, and 7, we'll get to those. The millennial kingdom is mentioned again four more times. Seven times in these first seven verses alone, Scripture says the millennial kingdom, the 1,000-year reign. Now, if you were paying close attention last week, you noticed someone was missing from Christ's judgment. He threw the beast and the false prophet into the pit. But if we remember in our study of the beastly trinity, there is a third part of Satan's imitation of God's holy trinity. It was the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon, who is Satan. Jesus hasn't forgot about him. He did not escape. Jesus has a special plan for, him, plan for him here. Now we read that he seized Satan and bound him for a thousand years. And again, I think this is probably the best argument for pre-millennial, premillennialism. Jesus didn't simply limit Satan. We read that an angel, a messenger of God, bound him. And not only bound him, put him in a pit. That word in the Greek is abyss. And then he sealed that pit. That doesn't sound like limiting Satan. That doesn't sound like tying one hand behind his back or putting a blindfold over his eyes, which some people teach. Because when you, t when, when you hold that view, that post-millennial view, or that amillennial view, you have to explain the de depravity that still exists in humanity today. Is the world getting better? Are things getting better? How can you explain that? How can you explain the de depravity that still ex exists in mankind today? We read that this angel bound him again. Why? So that he could deceive the nations no more. And again, we see the role of Satan in people's lives. He is the great deceiver. He is the liar. He is the manipulator. He seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. And he does that not with weapons of this world, but through lies.
And is he still doing that today? That's the question. Is Satan still deceiving men today or has he been completely defeated? Already not yet. Already not yet. Do you know what that means? Satan is already defeated. But his time has not come to an end. So he has already been defeated, but his time is not yet here. He is still operating. He is still moving throughout this world. What did Peter write in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses, verse 8? After Christ had died and rose again and ascended to the right hand of his father. What did, people, what did Peter warn the church? He said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That sounds like an active enemy to me. It seems like that would be a strange warning if Satan was already bound. Now again, some say that his activities have been restricted, but that is not the picture we are given in this chapter. He is tied, thrown into a pit, the pit is closed up, and then it's sealed. Now, some suggest that, well, maybe it's talking about binding Satan on a personal level. Remember, that's that kingdom now theology. That's the idea that we can speak things into existence because God has given us the same giftings of Jesus Christ. That we can operate as small messiahs in this world, binding things in the name of Jesus Christ. But again... That would mean that the symbolism used in this scripture is overhyping or overstating the reality of that. And we've talked talked a little bit about this. Whenever scripture uses symbolism, it never over-promises and under-delivers. Do you understand what I'm saying? The picture or the symbol is never greater than the actual event itself. The symbol pales in comparison to what we actually see. And we've seen that through the book of Revelation. So to say that this binding of Satan and throwing him into a pit and sealing that pit simply means that we are binding Satan in the lives of individuals, that seems like a gross overstatement. The language here simply doesn't allow for that. So again, this binding, what does it accomplish? It completely prevents and restricts Satan from deceiving the nations any longer. No more lies, no more confusion, no more impersonations, and no more imitations. Truth will reign supreme because truth is the antidote for Satan's deceptions. Satan will be bound. Truth will reign. No longer will we see Jesus through a mirror dimly lit. No longer will people be deceived by mirages. No more bait and switch schemes. The truth of God will reign. And that is the millennial kingdom. And that's until Satan is released again. Now let me pose this, because this is a very important question. Why in the world would Jesus release Satan again? Why would he have him bound and in chains and in a pit, sealed up, and then why would God choose to release Satan again? And this is what Dr. Lewis Schaefer says. He says, if you will tell me why God let him loose in the first place, then I'll tell you why God let him loose in the second place. See, I don't fully understand why God allows evil to exist. I don't understand why he allows Satan to operate in this world. But here's what I do know. God is sovereign and he is good. And I know that whatever he does, there's a tremendous purpose behind it. And just like Joseph being thrown in a pit by his own brothers... His brothers who wanted to murder him, to kill him, to take his life, but they decided, but it really wasn't their decision because God is sovereign and he's good. They decided to throw him in a pit and then sell him into slavery. But if you'll recall many years after that, when there was a famine in the land, 
that these brothers went to Egypt to buy food. And who did they find in Egypt ruling over the kingdom of Egypt? As Pharaoh's right-hand man, they they found their brother Joseph. And they fell down at his feet. And they said, please, we've, we've failed you. They wept and said, make us servants in your household. And what did Joseph say to them? What you have met for destruction, God has used for good. So again, I don't fully understand why God allows evil, and I don't know why God will release Satan again, but I know that his plans are good, and he will have a sovereign purpose behind them. Look at verse 4. Then I saw thrones. And seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. And for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And if that were symbolic, I don't know why we'd hear see it repeated over and over again. I think the Lord knows we're kind of hard-headed. A thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. You might want to underline that. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So again, we see now that Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years, but he's not reigning alone, is he? There's actually four groups in scripture that we learn will be reigning with Jesus Christ during this millennial period. And the first group we find right here, it's the tribulation saints. It's those who live during that tribulation, that seven years of God's wrath after the church has been raptured. It's men and women who give their lives to Christ during that tribulation period because of the testimony of the 144,000 and the angel of the Lord and whatever scripture is left to find and read and believe. So men and women, will there'll be a great revival during that time, we learn. And those men and women, they will refuse the mark of the beast. There will be a time, as we've learned, that the beast will demand that he be worshipped. And part of that worship will be getting a mark. That mark will say 666, and it will be on the hand or on the forehead. And you'll need that mark, that implant, that chip, whatever it may be, to buy and sell, to be a part of the world's economy, to be a part of the world's marketplace. But we know that whoever receives that mark of the beast, that's a willful rebellion against God. And again, they will be judged by God. God will provide again a way for salvation and those who rebel against it. They will be judged because God is good and he is right. And the time of mercy will come to to an end. But during those times, those who reject the mark of the beast, they will be killed. They will die for their faith. And we see that this group of people will be reigning with Jesus Christ. But then we also see that there's thrones. And seated on them were those whom the authority to judge was committed. So who are these others? where there's three additional groups that will be ruling and reigning that we learn about in, in Scripture, groups that God has promised to give authority to rule and reign with him. These are the ones that share in the first resurrection, the ones who are called blessed and holy. So who are they? One, they're the Old Testament saints. Now, you hear this question all the time, Okay, we're saved because of our faith in Christ alone, right? What about the Old Testament saints? Before Christ came, they died. So how in the world can they be saved if Jesus hadn't come and died yet? Well, our our salvation comes from a Messiah that has come, right? We're looking back into history, and we're looking at the work of the cross, 
and we're looking back at Christ's resurrection, and we're believing in that for salvation, right? The Old Testament saints, Abraham, what do we read about Abraham? He believed, and it was counted, or accounted to him as righteousness. So they looked to a Messiah. They believed in the promised Messiah. They looked forward into history. And because they looked forward into history and believed, Daniel and David and Abraham and Joseph will be meeting them in heaven, sitting and talking with them, hearing in full technicolor detail all the events that we've read about in Scripture. Moses. We read about that in Daniel 7, that these saints are promised to rule and reign with Jesus. Now we also know that Jesus made a very specific to his promise to his disciples. In Matthew 19, 28, we read that Jesus said to his disciples, his apostles, assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, that's what he's talking about here, the first resurrection, in the re regeneration when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's about as clear as it gets. So we have the Old Testament believers, we have the New Testament believers, or, oh, I skipped ahead, we have the apostles, and then who's that third group? Look around. Shake a friend's hand, shake a hand next to you. New Testament believers, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Do you not know, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? He was talking about division in the church. People were arguing and taking their brothers and sisters in Christ to court. And he's like, guys, you can't settle this. Do you know what your future holds? You're going to be reigning with Christ. You're going to be judging with him, ruling with him, and you can't even deal with this issue with this goat or whatever you're arguing over. 2 Timothy 2, Paul tells Timothy, if we endure, we will reign with him. So th these are the four groups that will be reigning with Christ. The martyred saints, the tribulation saints, Old Testament believers, the apostles, the disciples, and the church of Christ. And that church, we read in Revelation 5, that church is going to sing a new song. I don't know the melody, so I'll just read you the lyrics. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. So what does this look like? Again, we need a better idea of eternity. Because if it's simply clouds and harps, man, we're missing it. We have no idea what the joy of eternity in the presence of God looks like. Well, part, part of that eternity is this millennial kingdom. So what's that going to look like? What's it going to look like for a believer to rule and reign and have authority and responsibility over what is left here on earth? What are we going to be doing with Jesus for a thousand years? Well, to be honest, it really depends on what you've done with Jesus here. It has everything to do with what you have done for the kingdom of God by the power of the Spirit, in the name of Christ. What have you done with Jesus here? See, there's two parables in the gospel, two stories that Jesus tells us about the kingdom. He says the kingdom of God is like. He often started his parables that way. The kingdom of God is like. Now, these two parables, you can see them in Luke 19 and Matthew 25, if you write them down. They're very similar in both of these parables, a master instructs his servants to take his money and invest it while he's gone. The master is going to leave. He's going to give different ser servants different amounts of money. 
In Luke 19, I believe it's mina. In Matthew 25, it's talents. And he says, invest my money while I'm gone. And then he returns to his servants after his travels and he checks in with them to see what they have gained from those investments. And in each of those parables, the first two servants come to him and one says, you know, I took your five and I made ten out of it. And the second one comes and says, I I took your ten and I made twenty out of it. We invested what you gave us well and we doubled it. But also in each of these parables, there's a third servant, and that third servant did nothing with it. They took what God had, or the master, had given them, and they buried it in the ground. They did absolutely nothing with it. And in one of the parables, there's a harsh judgment pronounced on that man who did nothing with it. He said, take what he has away from him, and then cast him out into out of darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Guys, there seems to be a direct correlation between what we do for the kingdom of God here on earth and what we will be responsible for in this millennial kingdom. But understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you leave here and you're like, all right, it's all about good works now. It's all about helping old ladies cross the street. It's all about helping people move when they need to move. And and I'm just going to be a man or woman of good works. Not that there's anything wrong about that, but we can become really legalistic about what those good works look like as if somehow we're going to earn a right standing with God in heaven. That's not what this is about. Let me remind you what those talents are. Because that one servant took his talent and he buried it in the ground. Did nothing with it. And then he was cast out into outer darkness. So what was that talent? Some say it's our gifts, it's our abilities, it's the things that God has given us. And I think we're on the right track. But I think all we need to do is look back to the parable of the seed and the sower. The seed that the sower throws and some of that seed falls on dry ground, the roadway, compressed ground, hard, hard soil, Arizona soil, and it lays on the top and there's no opportunity for it to do anything because the crows fly in and they eat that seed and it is gone. Nothing comes of it. Some of that seed is thrown in the weeds and although something sprouts up, the weeds choke it out, and there is nothing left. And some is of the seed is thrown in rocky ground. It's just not deep enough, and that also sprouts up quickly. And there seems to be a lot of zeal and a lot of excitement, but again, there's no soil, there's no depth, and the sun beats down on it, trials of life beat down on it, and it dries out. And there's no produce. There's that, that seed produces nothing. But then, some of that seed, where does it land? In the good soil. And it goes down deep. And it grows. And it produces much fruit, we read. And Jesus says, you don't have to wonder what that seed is. It is the word of God. It is the gospel. And when you receive the gospel fully, you allow it to go deep. It bears much fruit. Are we allowing the gospel of Jesus Christ to find deep root in the soil of our hearts? Because think about this. We try so often to bear that fruit on our our own. Oh, I want to be responsible for great things. I mean, even in the parable... The master says to the servants who made a great increase of his finances, he said, now that you've been faithful in the little things, I'm going to give you rule and reign over many things. And in one of the parables, Luke 19, they even say, that master says, I'm going to give you reign over many cities. But again, this fruit is not because we dig in, roll up our sleeves, wipe the sweat off our brow and work in the flesh. Jesus says, if you will abide in me, you will bear much fruit. 
If you will remain in me, there is the increase. The secret here is abiding in Jesus Christ, resting in him, seeking him, growing in our understanding of him, fixing our eyes in, on him, because as we do that, we are investing in the kingdom of God, and he will use that to stir up in us a heart for the lost and a passion for his work, a passion for moving the kingdom of God forward, and that's what we de desperately need. We need to care the church is full of people that simply, they just don't care. The only thing they care about is their life. What I'm going to watch on TV this afternoon or what I'm going to buy later on or, or this house or this car. Again, not that having things is wrong, but we, if we are simply consumed with our own needs, we have missed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I promise we're not abiding in Christ. Because when we abide in him, his desires become our desires. And we can't help but get out into this world and preach the gospel, not only in word, but deed. We can't help but meet the needs of others. We can't help to see the hurting and want to come in and do our best to shoulder their burdens. And I am so thankful that I have examples like many men and women in this fellowship to show me what that looks like. That's the increase. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. So again, these men and women that are going to have responsibilities for many, many cities, they are going to be men and women that have spent a great deal of time in the presence of their Savior. They're going to be men and women that lead sacrificially and that's why I know Jesus will give them so much responsibility. They will lead as servants. We hear this, oh, we're going to get a judge? Awesome. Man, I'm going to run my city the way that America needs to be run. But I know for a fact the men and women that will have the most responsibility will probably be people we don't even know because they've been serving behind the scenes not for pats on the back, not to be noticed by men, but simply because they love Jesus. Brian and Patty are going to have New York City. Oh, I didn't know Brian was here. Just by saying their names, I've just demoted them to like Yuma. I am so sorry, Brian. <laughs> So what, what in, here, here's another question. It kind of seems like all of humanity, because of their unrighteousness, has been judged. Who's going to be left on this earth? If, if all, everyone who's part of the first resurrection is coming down with Christ to rule and reign with him, who is left here on the earth to even reign over? a great question but there is a group of people left if you'll recall the nation of Israel two thirds of the nation of Israel has been killed but one third remains Zechariah prophesies about this in Zechariah 13 9 where he says I will bring the one third through the fire I will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested they will call on my name and I will answer them and I will, will say this is my people and each one will say the Lord is my God the Old Testament also refers to a time where the Jewish people will look at the hands and the feet of Jesus and they'll say where did you get those scars and he'll say I was wounded in the house of my friends speaking of them and that will be the day during that millennial kingdom where they'll say Jesus is the Messiah he is the Lord he is the king of kings but unfortunately as we'll see here as we close that won't be enough look at verse 7 and when the thousand years are ended Satan will be released from his prison 
And you will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain on the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Now, remember, this is a thousand years of Christ's reign. We have one third of the Jewish people still alive. And for a thousand years, they're going to marry and and multiply and their families will grow and there will be many, many people still here on earth. But when Satan is released, he will still deceive many. Think about this for a moment. Men and women will grow up in the very presence of Jesus Christ. And not even in the present, only in the presence of Jesus Christ, but they will live in a world of perfection where there's no sickness, there's no injustice. Do you know why there's no injustice? Because Brian and Patty will be ruling over a city. <laughs> and if someone even thinks of something, Brian and Patty will say, no, that's not, that, that doesn't belong here. And, that, and, I, and I, I, I poke fun, but that, that will be part of our responsibility. That this is, this is God's perfect plan for humanity. It will be a utopia, perfect peace. We read in the scriptures that, that uh, children will play with poisonous animals. The lion will lay down with the lamb. There's going to be perfect peace, no sickness. And even in the midst of that, at the first opportunity, some will still rebel. Look at verse 10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day there, day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead. This is the second resurrection now. Trust me, you want to be a part of the first resurrection, not the second resurrection. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Again, some will read that and say, okay, God will look at our name. He'll find our name in his book of life. And then he'll look at the deeds that we have done. And then he'll make a a judgment call. All right, your good deeds, okay, they somewhat outweighed your bad deeds. Come on in. That's what most people believe. They, they, they may not say that specifically, but you say, hey, are you going to be in eternity with Jesus Christ? Yes. Why? Because I'm a good person. But when God opens that book of life, there's one thing he's looking for. Your name. That's it. Is your name written in the book of life? How do you get your name written in the book of life? You believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. That he died and that he rose again for you to pay for your sins. And if your name's written there, you're not going to be part of this judgment. There's a whole separate judgment and it's a much better judgment. It's where that authority is given that we talked about. But this judgment, men and women will stand before God and they'll say, but I was a good person, but they'll be drowned out by a reading of all their offenses, all the sins that they have, been, they have committed. And that idea that they were a good person, that idea is going to leave them quickly. Because our idea, this thought of us being a good person, that's in comparison, Right? To the people on TV, well, I'm not like them. I'm not like the people on the news. They, that guy did what? Oh man, that makes me feel good about myself because I'm not capable of that. But then the Lord will go through those many offenses. You lied. You looked at this. You had hatred in your heart. You lusted after that person. And that's going to last a long time for every individual because we are broken and we are sinful. We see in verse 13, 
and the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades, there's the final judgment of death. They were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That This is the final judgment. Men and women, they'll live in perfect peace, in a literal utopia, and even more importantly, in the presence of Jesus Christ, and they will still be deceived by Satan. How is that possible? Guys, this isn't the first time that has happened. You guys remember a couple named Adam and Eve? They were living in perfection, had all that they ever needed. They had close communion with God. And what did they do? They decided that wasn't enough. It's not that hard to believe. Guys, never underestimate the depths of our sinful nature. Guys, truth means nothing to a man who is hell-bent on sinning. And I know you've experienced this as you've counseled people that you care about or before you came to know Christ as people counseled you. Truth meant nothing to you. You just wanted to sin. And there's going to be people who are sinless because of lack of opportunity in the millennial kingdom. But once that opportunity presents itself, they will rebel. There'll be those who are fed up with the current administration. They'll look at all that Jesus has provided for them, the peace, the prosperity, and the perfection, and they'll be deceived. And Satan will convince them to attack the saints, to make war against Jesus and all of us. But again, with a word, they will be consumed by fire. And Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire with the beast and the false prophet, and they will be tormented day and night forever. They'll be thrown into the pit of fire. And then that second resurrection, where mankind is judged for what they have done, and if their name is not written in the book of life, they will also be cast into the lake of fire. Guys, I know this is hard to hear. And if you're new here this morning, you're thinking, man, that's what church is all about, hellfire and brimstone. But as I reminded everyone last week, don't look at Revelation 20 without looking at the rest of Scripture. It's a thousands upon thousands of years of Jesus begging his creation to come into a right relationship with him. Begging his creation to understand the great love he has for them. Begging his, his creation to understand that there is no good works that it will make us right before God. That he has made a way through his son Jesus Christ. That is the only way for our names to be written in the book of life but there will be a day of final judgment. And I have to close with this, guys. If, if you're sitting here thinking today, man, I'm a believer. I don't have to worry about any of this. I know my name's there. I don't have to be concerned about this final judgment. I'm saved. I know my name is written in the book of life. That's all that matters to me. I'm so grateful that the early church didn't have that mindset. Because of the early church, we're standing here today. I'm so glad Paul didn't have that mindset. Well, I'm saved, I'm good. You guys, good luck. This was Paul's heart, and God, let this heart be within us. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among me, uh, among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom, will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. I have not hesitated. 
when our lives are marked with hesitation. Oh, I don't want to say that to them. I'm afraid of what they're going to think of me. We're not even afraid of physical persecution. We're afraid of dirty looks. And that makes us hesitate. And again, I'm preaching to myself. But Paul says, I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. I care about you. My life means nothing to me. What means something to me is that you know that God loves you and he right, wants a right relationship with you and he's provided through that, that through the person of Jesus Christ. And I will share that with you and I will live a life that testifies of that love and when I meet God on that last day, your blood will not be on my hands because I did everything in my power to share the gospel with you.